you know, revolutionary violence was was very rarely a danger in England. It's not the case since the 17th century that quite small religious minorities have been able to exert a pretty startling political impact. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. Amidst the recurring threats posed by Islamic extremists to members of our parliament, rapidly changing demographics, and the overshadowing of our elections by foreign wars, can England survive as a nation? To discuss this question and many more, I'm joined by the renowned historian Robert Toombs, the author of The English and Their History. Thank you very much, Robert, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. What threat does Islamic extremism pose to England? Well, I think it's difficult to say. I mean, my feeling is, and I don't pretend to any kind of expertise here, that the threat which is real and worrying has been encouraged by, well, I think rather weak policing. Um, And the encouragement of extreme displays of militancy in the streets. Uh, And as we know, once people are allowed to get away with with, uh, activities which are illegal or on the verge of illegality, then it encourages greater daring, greater uh, a greater sort of militancy. Have we seen a situation before where our parliamentarians have been cowed by extremist mobs outside? I know that there have been a few times in history, in English history, where this perhaps has happened, um, but not in many years. No, not in many years. I mean, I, my only thought was that this was rather like the violence that led up to the Great Reform Bill uh, in, in the early 1830s. When you did have major public unrest, uh, rioting, um, the burning down of the palace of the Bishop of Bristol, um, uh, uh, general, a general sense that the country was on the verge of revolution. And the direct threat of revolutionary violence did, to some extent, cow, or perhaps more than to some extent, did really cow Parliament uh, into uh, accepting that it would adopt reform. The House of Lords was the one that stood out against it, and, but they too were, were eventually uh, cowed, not so much by popular violence, though that, that might have happened eventually, but by the King, uh, William IV, deciding that he would, if necessary, uh, create peers to, uh, to, to overthrow their majority. So we did have a, a, a Parliamentary Reform Act, which uh, it was less than, less than it looked, as it were, not, not the origin of our liberty, but a, a very minimum uh, change in our political system. And that was enough, to, at least, to take the edge off uh, popular radicalism. And I think it's, in a sense, the origin of our, let's say, slightly mythological view of British history, which is that um, those in power were always wise enough to make sufficient concessions to stave off revolutionary violence. There may be certain truth in that, but you know, revolutionary violence was, was very rarely a danger in England. Um, but I think it's, it's not the case since the 17th century that quite small religious minorities have been able to exert a pretty startling political impact. Uh, you know, you, you might think of uh, Guy Fawkes, uh, and the gunpowder plotters, or you might think of the Puritans and the origins of the Civil War against Charles I. But, uh, you know, we, we did think, I suppose, that religion, or at least religious extremism, had left our politics really in the 17th century. It's interesting that this threat posed by Islamic extremists, particularly to MPs, has led to a situation where some MPs are now having to have bodyguards follow them around. I know that during the Troubles, several MPs were murdered by IRA terrorists. Yes. And more recently, we had the murder of David Amos by an Islamic extremist. So the threat has always, or is definitely there, and it's a, it poses a real threat to MP security. So yes. maybe you can talk a bit about that. Well, obviously, I mean, Parliament does remain the, the focus of our political life. And you only have to walk past Parliament on any day of the week, practically, and you can see there's a kind of you know, presence of people often demonstrating or petitioning or whatever, you know, it really still is our, our focus in the way that in many countries it's not really. You know, I, I know France quite well, and you can walk past the French Parliament on most days, and it's never quite clear if it's open or not. Uh, there, are not there are not usually any bo- people there. Um, so, you know, part of our political tradition is that Parliament is the focus of a lot of emotion. 
and that people do think they have the right to go to Parliament and petition. Because they used to petition, the Chartists petitioned, you know, the vast Chartist demonstration in uh, 1848 and the delivery of an enormous petition for political reform to Parliament, which in the end came to nothing. But it, it had an effect on the way MPs uh, reacted, I think. Um, and um, w the, but the, the case you mentioned of... I mean, OK, there are, I suppose, several ways of putting pressure on Parliament. The most obvious and the most important is by voting. But we, we, regard, we tend to regard um, demonstration as also part of a political constitution in a way. So standing outside Parliament with banners is, is another way of doing it. Of course, the IRA terrorism is a, is a different kettle of fish. And um, there we had a really very small number of very well-organized people who could exercise um, a, a pretty extreme threat. You know, the, 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 the bombing of the, of the Grand Hotel in Brighton was, I suppose, the most dangerous act of terrorism since Guy Fawkes. Uh, it could have wiped out a large part of the government. Um, you know, we're not talking about that kind of threat. We're talking about what seems to be a mixture of um, people who feel they want to make their views about Palestine heard. I, I walked through one of the demonstrations myself. A, a lot of the people there were, were Muslim families. You know, they were out with their children to show that they, they sympathised with Palestine. Then there were the Trotskyites, who was the, the, social, you know, the, work, the Socialist Workers' Party, who seemed to be always there on these occasions. And then I think there was a, a hardcore element, clearly. And indeed, I spoke to the... Um, the the man who pickets outside the Foreign Office on behalf of Iranian freedom, very brave man who'd been threatened. Uh, we, we, you know, someone said, oh, you'll have your, we'll come and behead you. So there was a very nasty Islamist element too, though I think probably a very small one. So it's this combination of what you might call legitimate protest, though on a scale that we rarely see so repetitively. And I, in some ways, the, re the repetition of it is what makes the impact mixed with you know, a, a penumbra of extremism, which could include violence uh, um, against individual MPs or against Parliament, or indeed, of course, it could lead to terrorist action of the sort we've been warned about as, as a growing danger. So I think this is a, a rather different um, phenomenon from that of, you know, the suffragettes, the chartists. Um, and it goes back, I, I think I might say, we probably haven't seen quite this since the 17th century. Do you think that it's also unique in the uh, in the aspect that it's a particularly focused on a foreign war in Israel and Gaza, and this is no, has nothing to do with domestic politics? Unless you could argue that because we've imported so many people, Muslims, frankly, um, in the last 20, 30, 40 years, this has now become a kind of domestic and British issue. Yes. I think clearly it has. Um, and uh, I think you see the same thing in France. You probably see the same thing in Germany, in which governments have now to take account of the um, the views of ethnic minorities on foreign policy matters. Well, just look at the Rochdale by-election. This yes. is an, a fantastic example of this, where candidates on, in all parties are only seemingly, seemingly talking about Gaza. Well, that seems to be the issue that's at least dominating the campaign, particularly if, if you look at someone like George Galloway, who launched his campaign with a big Palestinian flag. Yes. And yes, uh, perhaps, I'm, perhaps I'm cynical. And I'm, I'm not denying that many people feel genuine emotion about what's happening in Gaza. But it, 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 is, it does seem to be very selective. Um, we haven't had such demonstrations about the, the fate of the Uyghurs in China or the Rohingya in Burma or the, 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 the very brave people... Um, um, struggling for, for freedom in Iran, for obvious reasons, because many of these people are pro-Iranian, um, or indeed of the terrible destruction in, in Syria. Um, hundreds of thousands of people killed. Um, this seems not to be on the radar. So people who say that they're so upset about Palestine, you, you, you know, one cannot but ask why this is the issue that causes such emotion and not, and not other issues. After all, we are not very much involved in what happens in Gaza. We have very little ability to influence it. We had very little in ability to influence what happened in Syria. And indeed, we decided not to try to do anything. Um, and so what is it that's happening? 
Uh, and I think part of it is that various radical elements see this as a useful stick for mobilizing popular a action. And I think uh, certain people from certain ethnic minorities see this as a way of, and this is just my, my superficial impression, of, of saying that we are here and we have the right to be heard. Um, uh, you know, we, you can't ignore us. And you see this in, you know, you, no doubt we'll see this in the Rochdale by-election and, uh, and within the Labour Party, clearly. So I think it's, a, it's in part a demand for the recognition of uh, a minority and of giving it a place within our, um, our political system. Now, you, you might say that's a very dangerous thing because we tend not, at least we haven't for, for quite a long time, thought that minority groups had a particular um, position within our political system. Again, not since the 17th century, perhaps. Though, you know, in the 19th century, religion was certainly at the heart, it was at the heart of Victorian politics. And religion remained important well into the 20th century, but in the 19th century was certainly dominant. So you did have the so-called nonconformist conscience. You did have very activist members of dissenting uh, churches. And I suppose there's a certain similarity here in which, um, you know, if, 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 if for a way, if in a way you could compare uh, uh, Muslims in Britain with, let's say, um, Baptists in the 17th century or Methodists in the 19th century, you could say, well, here is a group of people who are saying um, we want to be recognised as a political force and a legit with a legitimate right to express our view. And in a way, you know, any, any, anything could 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 serve as grist to that mill. You know, the, I think it was, in a way, it was first seen with the Salman Rushdie affair quite a long time ago now. Um, uh, it was seen with the, recent, the fairly recent case of the Batley teacher. You know, there are, there are, there are, there are ways in which people are saying, we, we are here and we want to be listened to. Of course, in France, it's been much more extreme. Um, we had a teacher who was forced into hiding. The French had a teacher who was publicly beheaded. So I mean, but I th so I think there is there is a danger of an extreme minority hijacking this kind of popular movement, and it's of course ideal for them to be able to do so. And we've also perhaps seen the return of blasphemy law blasphemy laws uh, by the back door. Yes. Where if today I wanted to burn a copy of the Quran, I wouldn't be able to do that in public, and um, the police would arrest me for a hate crime and so on, and um, because I'm offending one particular group, or I'm they could argue that I'm, I'm sort of riling up public unrest and so on. Yes. Um, whereas, of course, you can burn as many Bibles as you like, or indeed, I presume you can burn lots of religious texts if you wish to, except this one. Um, and so it is a blasphemy law which protects a particular religious sensibility. And I think undeniably, because um, the people involved will, um, will respond with violence, or have done. Now, is it, is it therefore right for the police and the authorities to regard this as a matter of public order? In other words, if I go out onto Cambridge Market and start tearing up a Koran, then I will. is it right for the police to say, you are causing a breach of the peace? Well, in our, tradi in our traditional view of, um, of public order, we would say, yes, you, know, you, you can't go out and start causing trouble. Uh, you know, and you can't sort of say, well, I have a theoretical right to do this and you have to protect me. I think it's reasonable to say people should be careful in what they do. But nevertheless, it is worrying, as you say, that we have, in effect, a kind of blasphemy law which is enforced by intimidation. Talking about political and religious strife in Britain at the moment, and I think this is really pertinent in terms of um, all the issues we've just been talking about, these marches every single weekend, since the war in Gaza started, since those terrible attacks from Hamas on the Israelis. Can you compare those um, kind of that political and cultural and religious strife today with perhaps previous examples of this throughout English history, the Reformation, the English Civil War? And do you envisage the problems that we're having now to perhaps ramp up and become as serious as those other things that I've just mentioned throughout English history? Um, I can't see that at the moment. Uh, you know, the things like the Reformation were off, usually in the control of the authorities. You know, it was Henry VIII, and then it was and it was Elizabeth, and it was Mary. You know, the, the, this was largely a top-down phenomenon. 
which the, the mass of the population had to accept. Except for, uh, you know, there were dissenting minorities, Catholic first of all, Puritan later. And, and they proved that they could cause quite a lot of um, disturbance. Um, you might say, well, they, they had a legitimate right to do so, but the fact is they, they did do so, and it was quite, it was quite dangerous. In the end, ended up in, a, in the worst civil conflict we've ever had, the uh, civil war, not only in England, but also in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, so yes, it, it's ter- it can be terribly dangerous. But then it was um, a conflict in which you know, large numbers of people and large parts of the elite got involved willy-nilly. Um, at the moment, it's, after all, a, a minority, which is very untypical of public opinion as a whole, I think. You know, public opinion as a whole hates to see bloodshed in foreign countries, but it's not necessarily the thing that causes the most concern. Um, the people who really care about what's happening in Gaza, or say they do, are nevertheless a quite small minority. And I, I think, as we all know, means of communication are what can give minorities sudden um, extra power. I often think of how the printing press, you know, a primitive mechanical, little mechanical machine could, could to put it, in a sense, cause 200 years of, of mayhem in Europe. Um, how much more powerful our social media and the whole the whole phenomenon of the of instantaneous communication globally in in mobilizing opinion in 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 passing certain messages in literally mobilizing people to attend um demonstrations i mean that's a huge uh, a hugely important and powerful weapon and one that i think we have no idea how to control yet if 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 our if our ancestors couldn't control caxton's printing press it's hard to see how we can control um, the internet. You know, the, when the Bible starts being produced in English, crowds of people come to listen to it being read out in St. Paul's and so on. And you know, you'd have to say, well, it was, it was religion and all that religion stood for. And it stands for a lot of things. It's not just theology. It's a whole social system. It's a whole way of life. It's, it's community. This is what was disrupted by the Reformation. And it took a, great, a very long time and, and very bloody struggles before people, in effect, got tired of it and said, we, we can't go on like this. Now, um, how, how close are we to that? Well, I, I hope we're not close to it. Um, after all, uh, as I said, we're talking about small minorities and we're talking about a conflict that's going on a long way f- away from here. This is not a conflict that's taking place within Britain, at least not yet. So I don't think one should be over alarmed by this. But nevertheless, that if it's true that many, well, it's clearly true that a certain number of MPs have been threatened, have have been killed, um, and fear for their lives and the safety of their families, that is a terrible, uh, a terrible danger. And I think it's something that the authorities can't just wring their hands over and say, oh, this is all terrible. They really do have to do something about it and do something fairly robust. It's fascinating. In your book, The English and Their History, you talk about how England was largely insulated compared to the continent um, against religious violence, against political violence until the Civil War, when you had, obviously, you know, that that huge eruption um, of all those uh, the the religious conflicts come to Britain. And then after the the English Civil War, again, you could argue that we were largely um, insulated from political violence compared to, say, France. And yes. I know you've studied France a lot yeah. recently. Perhaps one could make the same argument in terms of more contemporary issues as well. I mean, particularly when you compare England to France, as you say, there seems to have been far more Islamic violence in France mm. than in England. Do you agree with that thesis? And why do you think that is, if so? Let me come on to contemporary France in a moment, mm. if I could. It, you know, if you were to say, why, why has Britain, and particularly England, because Ireland's a different matter, but why has Great Britain had a fairly peaceful history since the late 17th century? Fairly peaceful. Um, not entirely peaceful. Um, why has it never had a... It hasn't had a revolution since 1688? Um, I think the answers are, in a sense, fairly simple. One is that the, the British state has been a pretty strong um, institution. Is it still? 
that I'm not sure of. Um, the elites, on the whole, fairly united in the desire to maintain the system, maintain the state, not, not bring it down, which was not the case in France. The elites were, were deeply divided and hence were willing to side with revolutionism and take advantage of it. Is it still the case that the, our elites are united? Um, the third thing is, um, and this is something that we energetically cross our fingers over and say that let's, we have to hope. I mean, the third thing is, is defeat in war. Major revolutions almost always are the consequence of some sort of defeat, which undermines the legitimacy or, or the physical power of the state. You, know, you can think of France in 1789 and again in 1870. You can obviously think of Russia uh, in, in 1917, Germany in 1918, Austria, etc. It's when, when the state is defeated that then all bets are off and then you get conflicts over who, who is to succeed, who is, who is legitimately um, able to govern. Um, we haven't, after all, been defeated in a major war since the loss of America. Um, and uh, therefore, we have never been faced with this kind of danger. Um, let's hope we never will be. You know, um, I think you, you, you mentioned our island position. It's, it's very useful to have 20 miles of, of water between you and the continent at times. And that's what saved us in 1940, really. Uh, and, um, you know, let's hope, let's hope we're still immune to this kind of disaster. But if not, well, you know, I think anything, anything can happen. I want to quote from your book. You said, The English and Their History. In recent decades, the English have largely accommodated the changes brought by changing moralities and multi-ethnicity, incorporating them into new varieties of Englishness. Who could be more English today than Rita Ora and Dizzy Rascal, Jessica Ennis and Rio Ferdinand? Do you believe in this statement still? And I know that, I know that was written about 10 years ago yeah. when you first wrote the book. I mean, those uh, celebrities you chose are quite sort of dates you a little bit. I it does. Oh, well, there's a new edition which has different names, <laughs> which I could perhaps give a plug to. There's a new, a new edition that came out late last year, and it does. I did update the names, but uh, because it's very easy, it does date very quickly, as you say. Um, well, OK, I was quite optimistic, and I still remain um, fairly optimistic, or at least not very pessimistic. I mean, we, we've had major immigration on an unprecedented scale, at least unprecedented in modern times. And I think we've been fairly successful in, in uh, integrating people. You know, in, in the days of Enoch Powell, people were worried about immigration from, from the Caribbean or from West Africa or from East Africa. That's not what people are worried about now. And uh, in fact, we're, we're, we're very, the Conservative Party is very happy to have leaders who come from the, the immigration of that period. Um, so that it seems to me that that is, has been a success. Um, what the, the problem is, you know, of m minorities very recently arrived from a variety of countries, often war-torn countries, often people who are alienated or radicalised when they get here, uh, along with, unfortunately, left-behind communities in certain parts of the country who have ample reason to be discontented and for whom religion is one of the, the things that gives them some sort of sense of identity and pride. Um, I remember a very brilliant PhD student of mine who works on immigration in France saying, you know, you go to the, the, the Parisian banlieue where you have mass unemployment and people who are regarded as, you know, often in, in racist ways as inferior. And he said all they have are, is Islam and football. Uh, and you have to be very careful in how you how you treat that, you know, in France, as you know, that the attitude of the state has been much more, let's say, um, has been in some sense much more absolutist. Um, you cannot wear Islamic dress at school. Um, it's illegal to wear the burqa in public, and all that sort of thing. And it seemed to me that this was probably creating a a problem that wouldn't necessarily have existed. There are lots of people who are eager to immig to integrate. And I think it's um, um, one has to be very careful in, in, in how you respond to them. And I think, I mean, uh, uh, if I can mention um, 
of the Michaela School, Catherine Burbel Singh School in, in, in Wembley. There I've been on a number of occasions. It's, it's overwhelmingly made up of children from um, ethnic minorities. I have, I have a vague memory that 70% of the children there do not have English as their first language. Many of the girls wear, the, wear hijab, but that it, it, it's clearly not a problem in that context because these are children who are being very successfully integrated into our society, who are being taught that this is the society which, 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 is, now, which is now their society, it's their culture. They learn Shakespeare, they learn English history, they sing the national anthem. And the fact that, that in singing the national anthem they're wearing a, a, a head veil is not a problem at all. They are integrating and they wish to do so. The, the danger is when people are, and I'm afraid not all of our ed education system is as effective or as determined to do this as uh, the Michaela school is. And I think in that case, you do have a problem in which children are left in a kind of limbo. It, I mean, this happens, it happens with all immigrant societies. You know, it, it happened with the, with the Irish in England. It happened with the Italians in America. You tend to, if, commu if communities are, do not integrate or are not helped to integrate, or indeed in some ways are not, are, not, are not made to integrate, then you do get, you know, subcultures which are quite dangerous. You know, uh, uh, some of them could be criminal, um, you know, Al Capone and the Italian mafia. Some of them can be religious minor ex religious extremists. But I don't think that this is the inevitable consequence of immigration. And I did write in that book, and I think I would still, um, I would still say this, that, that um, immigration is as much part of our history as thatch cottages and cream teas. But that, of course, is because much of the immigration, until very recently, came from Commonwealth countries and had quite a lot in common, linguistically and culturally, with the British population. You know, the, the Windrush generation, which has been, of course, it was called the Empire Windrush, which, is, um, which has been to some extent mythologized. These were people who were pretty close to English culture in their religious beliefs, um, their, their, their language, their, often their you know, devotion to the monarchy. Um, and uh, this, is, this has proved to be, it seems to be a great success. But what we're talking about there is incredibly small numbers. Yes, yes. By comparison with now, I agree. And, I mean, and you know, we, we are, we are, you know, it can be said we are a nation of immigrants. Well, we are a nation in which, um, in the distant past, there was large-scale immigration, the Vikings. Um, there have been periodic immigrations of people from, um, from Ireland, from... Um, uh, Russia, Poland, um, from France, the, Hugu the famous Huguenots, that these were one-offs and they were fairly small in number. They didn't make much of an effect on the, the overall population. Okay, they, there was often a racist reaction. Um, Anti-Semitism in England was largely a response to um, th you know, what, what now seems very modest immigration from the Russian Empire at the, the end of the 19th century. Um, but... Um, this was nevertheless small-scale stuff, and it didn't leave um, an enormous. Uh, uh, it didn't have an enormous political impact, whereas we're, we're seeing now that perhaps, uh, on the scale in which we've seen it, it does have a political impact. I want to continue on this theme of um, Britain, uh, England being a nation of immigrants, and we they've always been here. That's the kind of, uh, I suppose, activist um, line, as it were. Particularly yeah. when you look at things like. Uh, contemporary BBC reports for children claiming that black people have been in Britain for thousands of years. You can look at Roman yeah. Britons who are black and so on. Yeah. And I think that there are certain myths yes. being created yes. around ethnic minorities' roles throughout um, our history and particularly their prominence in our history. Yes. Would you agree with that? Yes. I mean, I, you can see this is well-meaning myth-making. It's meant to make children from ethnic minorities feel at home, and that's you know that's a good thing, but a lot of it is not based on re on reality, um, and it seems to me it's healthier not to treat children of ethnic minorities as being you know t too I don't know too immature to accept basic facts. Um, Romans in Britain from North Africa were not black Africans; they were they were from the Greco-Roman world. Um, you know, th th there was no 
black Roman emperor in Britain. The the soldiers on Hadrian's Wall were not black from sub-Saharan Africans. They were people from um, what was then the with a pre-Arabic North Africa. Um, so I mean, th- and this this is okay. I mean, as I say, it's well-meaning. It's meant to make people feel good, but I don't believe that history should be a form of therapy. And I think one should re- should treat even children as being, you know, able to accept the facts. And the facts are that um, we have had a lot of migration recently, uh, and it's in a way it's. Um, it's falsifying the story of recent migrants to say, oh, well, people like you have always been here. Well, no, they haven't. These these people were doing something really new and, and actually quite difficult. And I think it's better to recognise that than to pretend that somehow we've always been a nation of immigrants and hence what's been happening in the last 20 years is, is nothing different. Because it is different. You mentioned Enoch Powell earlier, and I want to get back to this issue of integration. Now, he made a very, very controversial speech, the Rivers of Blood speech, famously, which changed the conversation around immigration in Britain. And I'm going to quote a fairly large section of it, so forgive me, viewer. Um, But I think it's really important for, for the discussion that we're having. He said, Here is a decent, ordinary fellow Englishman, talking about one of his constituents, who in broad daylight in my own town says to me, his member of parliament, that the country will not be worth living in for his children. I simply do not have the right to shrug my shoulders and think about something else. What he is saying, thousands and hundreds of thousands are saying and thinking, not throughout Great Britain perhaps, but in areas that are already undergoing the total transformation to which there is no parallel in a thousand years of English history. We must be mad, literally mad, as a nation to be permitting the annual inflow of some 50,000 dependents, who are for the most part the material of the future growth of the immigrant descended population. It is like watching a nation busily engaged in heaping up its own funeral pyre. Now he was talking about 50,000 people coming in every year. In 2022 there were 750,000. Yes. More people came in that year than in the years between 1964 and 2000 combined. Do you think that there is any grain of truth in what Mr. Powell was saying in that speech? Um, I, th- I think it's a, in, a, in a way it was a very double-edged speech, as you know. As you say, it affected, and indeed, in effect, it poisoned discussion of immigration. And perhaps it still, in a sense, does, in that it makes, in being seen as alarmist and racist, it made almost any discussion of immigration seem alarmist and racist. Um, so I think it was, it, was, it was an extremely unfortunate speech. And of course, he got him the sack. Um, Powell, as I remember, well, this is based on an academic article I read some years ago, was, was mainly drawing on his experience of India. You know, he, was, he was an imperialist and or had been for a while. Uh, he'd, he'd served in India... And what he, he spoke Urdu af- famously. Yes, and what he was afraid of was the development of a, of sectarian and tribal politics in Britain. He thought that politics should be about bread and butter issues. You know, the Labour Party should be the party of the working class, the Tories are the party of the middle class, and so on. And this was for him. This is what rational politics was. And what he seems to be worried about was that the of the importation of of kind of Indian style politics into Britain. Well, of course, that didn't happen until very, very recently. And so I think it is, again, it's very, it is, it is dangerous. But um, it is also, I think, um, it's been fanned by, I mean, okay, as I said this earlier, it's a very obvious point, by the ability of social media to magnify and exaggerate um, uh, feelings. I don't think we know what uh, most immigrants from from the Indian subcontinent or from Pakistan uh, think about what's going on in Gaza, or whether they whether they think about it very much. Um, uh, those people who who are here to to live and work and bring up families, I think in most cases appreciate what the country has done for them, what they have done for the country. But I think it, it, there is a danger when extremist minorities are 
deliberately trying to poison um, the um, and to create uh, to create division within our society. And it's not only it's not only by any means Islamists. I mean, as I said, when I went when I saw the demonstration, there were a lot of Trotskyites. But there's a lot of there's a lot of middle class white radicalism of the kind that you see now quite commonly in a number of in a number of areas. And so I think, you know, if we're going to be talking about this phenomenon of political extremism, I think one also has to look at why there is, um, um, you know, a, a, a not a not negligible um, part of the of the white middle class, young white middle class, which is so alienated. And also at why, um, I mean, I, I said earlier that the French... Um, uh, France was so vulnerable to revolution in the 19th century, largely because its own its elites were di- were so divided. Um, how much of our elite is now uh, is now divided? How how many of them feel that British society or British culture or indeed integration into Britain is something that they really feel strongly about or feel is important? Um, I think that's that seems to me more dangerous than. Um, a few Islamist hotheads. I hope there are only a few. Um, is the is the is the abandonment in many ways by large parts of the of of the white middle class of a, a strong sense of national solidarity and a feeling that this is a country that is worth preserving, de- defending. That that we have things that we that we should be grateful for and that we should be willing to protect. Okay, you know, Parliament is obviously one. Um, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, all politicians are crooks and so on. Well, this is the best we've been able to do over many centuries. Uh, and um, it's um, it's better than many countries have managed. And to treat it as being somehow uh, contemptible and uh, not worthy of, of defence seems to me to be to be very alarming. And the, um, you know, we, we, we haven't talked about the whole phenomenon of, you know, which is which is colloquially called woke wokeness, is a kind of um, re- renunciation of any sense of British and Western and European cultural um, legitimacy. Uh, you know, the, so- the so-called decolonization movement is saying, well, Europe was, was, at, was not very important except in the bad things it did. Europe is not responsible for progress in the world it's only responsible for degradation. You know, Britain, um, the British Empire, was not responsible for economic advancement, improvement, peace, law and order, the creation of state institutions. It was only about violence, slavery, exploitation, looting and theft. And um, although I never expected to spend um, part of my life defending the British Empire, it was not something that I ever was interest, was, was interested in. Um, it's become a thing that, in a sense, cannot cannot be avoided, because if you regard the British Empire as a kind of crime against humanity, and I once heard one distinguished historian say um, the British Empire is our Auschwitz or something like that, then what you're doing is is really undermining any sense that our history is something to be, I wouldn't say to be proud of, but in some sense to be grateful for, to feel some responsibility for and to feel is something that we ought to uh, be willing to to protect against whatever threat. I want to ask about whether England as an identity or Englishness as an identity can survive into the future. And I think there's a few elements to this question. So yes. the first one is to do with immigration and as you say, many, many people have come here in the last 20, 30 years from various different countries. Can those people truly become English in the sense that um, you and I are obviously English, our parents and grandparents, and we can trace our family history back here on this island where I can. I don't know about you, I'm sure as I suppose well. I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, but many hundreds of years. So that's one part of the question. The second part is, well, as you say, there are these kind of woke revolutionaries um, throughout the West who are questioning our identity, our culture, our history, saying that it's steeped in original sin mm. and we must start from a year zero and, and so on. Yep. And I suppose the third part is a kind of globalization, a movement to smudge the borders between and boundaries between nations and cultures 
and particularly the spread and influence of American ideas and culture mm. yeah. um, into Britain, into England. And again, perhaps that takes away from that, our, that uniqueness of our identity as a nation, particularly the younger generations here today. They may not think of the things um, of what, or what makes England special and unique to them. They may, they may be thinking on a more global level. I'm a global citizen. Yes. I'm a citizen of nowhere yeah. uh, rather than a citizen of somewhere. So yes. I suppose if you could answer the question, I know that's a broad thing on those three themes. You know, I, I mean, I... I... I think I would probably, if I were if I were questioned, I would say I'm fairly a fairly patriotic person, and I believe in the nation state. I believe in the democratically ruled, independent nation state, and I and I agree that this 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 whole idea is either under attack, partly by discrediting its history, not only here but in other countries too. I mean, the, the worst cases are probably Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and, and the United States, to say that your whole history is based on crime. Um, and therefore, nothing that you do is is of any value. We haven't got to that point yet, but we're some people are trying to push us towards that point. And I think that that is has a very corrosive effect. Um, after all, democracy is based on the idea. At least, democracy has always been practiced. is based on the idea of community. You you accept that you pay taxes to help people you don't know, because you're all part of the same community. Otherwise, why would I want to give my money to people in Scotland or, you know, or in, in Liverpool whom I don't know and don't particularly feel anything about, etc. Why should I not um, give it all to Oxfam or, or, you know, or to the Palestinians or whatever? You know, you have to, you have to accept that there is a, a community, otherwise democracy just can't work. And the community we have is the, na is the national community. And if that is destroyed, then it seems to me all that we assume about our politics and our community is destroyed. I mean, Burke actually... Edmund Burke, in his great work on the French Revolution, said something which I think is, was, was very pertinent to Fre French experience, but is, I think, generally true. He, he talked slightly provocatively about prejudices. He said, we have prejudices. Um, they're prejudices about our own country, about the people who govern us, things like loyalty, that's a prejudice. Um, respect is a prejudice. And these prejudices are, are important. And he said, if, if these things are swept away, then the only thing you can rely on is force. The only way that a state can function is by force. And in that case, sooner or later, you will be governed by the people who control that force, which he said was, would be a popular general. And of course, he was perfectly right. It, was, it, was, it came to be Napoleon. I guess he was perhaps thinking of Cromwell. I don't know. So yes, if we don't want to live in a society in which... All of our relationships with our with our neighbours, with the people we work with, are all regulated by by law and by intimidation and by compulsion. Then we 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 want to preserve a sense of being a voluntary community of people who are happy to live together. And to go back to the question of you know the Windrush generation, these were people who did want to be part of the community. Um, of course, you know the danger, of course, is if if there are a lot of people who don't want to be part of the community, and that. That is yet to be seen. And also, can I just, sorry to interrupt, but there is also a, um, I suppose, a political idea spread by uh, many people in the elites over the last 20, 30 years in terms of integration that has said to those people who have come to Britain, you do not have to integrate. You can keep your own community. You can keep your own culture. You can keep your own history. You can keep all of that. And that's that's what's really important is maintaining your own values because that's equally as important as coming here and, and, and having English values as it were. Yeah. So there's a sort of conflicting message, isn't there, that first of all, England is a terrible place and we have a terrible history and so on. And then telling them they have to integrate and then also telling them that they must keep their own cultures. Yeah. So how, how are they meant to deal with those that, that those conflicting uh, messages? It is difficult, though I don't think it's impossible. Indeed, yeah. I think it's necessary in, in, uh, to, at least for a generation or two um, or longer. I mean, the Huguenots who we, we mentioned earlier there is still a Huguenot tradition in Britain. But the thing is, it is not seen as being in any way in conflict with, with British identity. Um, you can be both... I mean, when I went to school, I, a lot of the kids in my class were Polish. There were a lot of Polish families who came to Britain after the war. We, we kind of accepted that, they, that they, they had a Polish club and they did Polish folk dancing and it seemed a bit strange. But this, this did not conflict with them being at the same time British. 
And, you know, I mentioned the Michaela School, which, which did have a great, made a great impression on me when I visited it. You, you have, uh, for, for a girl wearing a hijab to be singing the national anthem is not, is not a problem. You can, you can do both, just as, you know, Roman Catholics from Ireland uh, could be assimilated into English society while remaining Catholics. So they can become English. Well, I think it's interesting because we've, I think we've rarely, if ever, had a sense of Englishness as ethnic purity, ethnic or racial purity, which is very different from many countries in which the idea of being a pure, you know, either a pure culture or a pure race, uh, or indeed a single religion, has dominated their sense of themselves. And I won't mention names, it will seem as though I'm criticising other countries. But, you know, there is, there is a strong ethnic nationalist tradition, which we've never really had. And I think, you know, anyone can be English who even, even superficially adopts English English life. Okay, English, you know, football has been a huge, it seems to me it's been a huge integrating factor. So has cricket. Um, you know, Norman Tebbit, great man in a way, you know, he, he applied the famous, became notorious cricket test in which he said, um, you know, you, you can see where people's loyalty lies uh, in, in whether they support England or, or India in a test match. Well, I, I, th in a way, that's true, but I don't think people now would think it very, very worrying that people of Indian descent in Britain support I India in a, in a match against England. And I think what is far more important is that is that they all play cricket. I mean, cricket brings them together. So you you, you, know, you might have a village cricket team. There can't be many village cricket teams which do not have an Indian spin bowler or whatever. And there, and and integration into England is actually quite easy, I think. Because we tend not to have an, a national ideology. In fact, I don't think we do. Uh, you know, you might say, well, you know, f freedom. But it's usually based on some sort of sense of loyalty to the community, either the local community or the national community represented by the monarch, a, a non-ideological symbol. And it's pretty easy to accept that. You don't have to have a particular religion. You can have no religion or, or you can be a Catholic or a Protestant or a Methodist or a Hindu. And you can be, you can be English. And I think that's been a great strength. But is it not the case, just to go back to this point about ethno-nationalism, yes. that we've only really had huge demographic changes in an incredibly short period of time? We have. Since yeah. the 1950s, yeah. really, but, but even then, really, since the 70s, 80s, 90s, yes. and so on. So this idea of ethno-nationalism would never come up in anyone's ideas in, in the Victorian times or before, because it, England really done. was it, a white well, country. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, England had been around for a long time. Um, as had Britain and the United Kingdom. So people were not forced to question what it was that made them English. They just, that's just what they were. They, Roger Scruton said it's, um, it's a sense that this is our home. But that's something that many people can buy into. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the major um, senses of belonging comes from, from the master of the English language. Um, you know, you, you, you can immediately tell if someone's English because of the way they speak, the fact is. Uh, we're very sensitive to linguistic signals in a way that other countries are not. I don't think America is so much, for example. Um, so, you know, you, once you've been schooled in England and you speak, you speak English, then you immediately appear to be English. I mean, I don't think on the whole people think of um, Rishi Sunak or uh, Suela Braverman or Kemi Badenoch as being sort of foreign. Um, indeed, in some ways, they seem you know, more English than many of the English. But they're very well integrated and so They on, are. And they come back. Oh, yeah. But, but there I mean, are the others who are. The, the point is, I think, that you, you can integrate um, quite a large population from overseas without it being seeming to be any strain on national identity. The fact that Rishi Sunak is prime minister, I don't think he's seen by anybody. I mean, there may be a tiny lunatic fringe. He's not seen by anyone as a threat to English national identity or British national identity. Uh, I mean, he's accepted as being, you know, he may be criticised for other reasons and admired for other reasons, but uh, as I've never heard anyone say, you know, he's not, he's not English, is he? I've never heard that. Uh, and, you know, when you've been to Winchester and you sound English, then in a, in a way you are English. That's what, what else, what other, what other proofs do you need? <laughs> and um, so I think we're, we're pretty, integration is quite easy in a way. I mean, okay, um, Ireland recently had, as you know, serious violence over immigration 
And a, a recent EU study showed Ireland as being one of the most racist countries in Europe. Ireland and Finland were the two most racist. And in the case of Ireland, it's because, well, I would suggest it is partly at least because the, Iri the, the whole idea of the Irish nation is based on ethno-nationalism and until very recently on Catholicism. Uh, and hence, you come from, you're a Muslim or, or you're a West Indian or you're an Afghan, you can't possibly be Irish. Uh, even if you're born in Ireland, you're not real Irish. I don't think we have that hang up to anything like the same extent. So that's why I'm not hugely pessimistic. But OK, the numbers of the numbers now are very great. And this is a, an experiment of a kind that we have never. Um, and the experiment happening in Europe has, has never been done before. You, know, you could say, well, well, the Viking, the Vikings, that's that's similar. And the Vikings transformed English society, the Anglo-Saxons transformed England and indeed made it England and, um, in a sense well caused the disappearance culturally at least of the of the ancient Britons uh, so you know these things do have and can have huge demographic and cultural effects but we're not talking about um, anything like the Anglo-Saxon invasions or the Viking invasions we're talking about people who on the whole want to come and live here and be part of the community and and the dangerous thing about what's happening now is that it, it's, it's, it's a threat to that process of integration. And the integration from the Commonwealth, which, as I say, I think had, was much easier, is not so easy when it's people from Albania or Afghanistan or even Syria. Um, and yes, that is, I think that, that's a real challenge, especially when those people have an... Ex have a background of violence and for whom their religion is their only real source of identity. And many of these people are young men. Yes. Particularly men. Yes. And, yes. And, and it's fascinating. That has been a huge, um, I suppose, population as a percentage of the people coming here all come from that same demographic of young men. Yes. And that, that will have its own impacts, I'm sure. I also yeah. wanted to mention as well the impact of uh, multicultural London English um, that's that seems to be spreading far and wide, particularly among younger generations. I mean, the, the sort of accent, yes, the, the accent and yes. the change, and, yes. and you talk about the impact of the Vikings and the, the yeah. Anglo-Saxons, the impact on our language is, is <laughs> immense. Yes. And I suspect that um, a recent immigration has had impact, has had an impact on English, as, as particularly as the younger generations are, are speaking it. Yeah, I think that's true, um, and it's um, so you know all of our ways of speaking are, are not are not terribly old. Uh, received pronunciation is seems to be mid-Victorian. Um, the language of Shakespeare was, you know, East Midlands, or I suppose in his case, West Midlands. Um, and, um, I, and I think, you know, there's a constant, there's a constant change in, in the way people speak and younger generations want to be different from their, from their parents and they want to sound fashionable. Um, but um, it, it has an effect on the language. I, I think this, you know, this is something that older people made it poor. I remember being in a taxi once with a, the cabbie saying, um, you never hear anybody speaking proper Cockney now, Gov. Which, you know, he says, my kids don't talk like, like me. Uh, it's just true. Exactly. Well, that is a shame in a way, I think. It's a shame in a way. When I live in East London, I've never, I never hear a, no. a, a Cockney accent ever. No, that's, tr no, that's true. But then, a, you know, a Cockney accent of the 1950s was not the same as a Cockney accent of the 1850s. You know, in, in Dickens, Co what, what marks Cockneys out is that they say w for the very very nice, uh, Mister Pickwick, and so on. You know that's all, that's completely gone. Uh, it's the same in Paris, which I know quite well, uh, and I'm told it's the same in 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 Germany. So in in you know the old Parisian accent has almost entirely disappeared. There was a sort of Parisian equivalent of Cockney that's that's gone, and all the kids, including white kids, including you know my 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 young in-laws, they 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 speak with a a slightly Arab, North African intonation, because that's, that's the smart thing to do. Well, you know, nothing we can do about that. This, this is what happens. I want to talk about another theme. And again, I'm going to quote from your book, The English and Their okay. History. England's political history since 1066 was that of a struggle to regain the ancient, ancient constitution from the crown and even from parliament, which some saw as the voice of Anglo-Saxon liberties, but others as merely another part of the Norman yoke. Ah, oh, yes. 
Do you believe that English people have lost their sense of freedom and liberty as being fundamentally English values? Um, I'm afraid I do tend to, to agree with that. Um, and I think what we're talking about, again, is the, is, is the, is the, is the, is the English middle class, especially the you know, young metropolitan elites for whom things like free speech are often seen as, as threatening or illegitimate. But also in our, our whole legal system has been kind of swamped by what seemed to me a, a whole new set of rules, some of them imposed socially, some of them imposed by employers and so on, uh, which are forcing people to adopt and to, to, to self-censor, uh, to accept beliefs that they don't really believe or appear to do so, to, take, to, to pay lip service at least to things they don't really believe. And um, and also to um, to in a sense to 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 have given up or to have found that the, the rights that many people thought that we enjoyed and had done so for centuries, you know, a right to trial by one's peers, a right to the presumption of innocence, a right to know what one is being accused of, uh, and by whom, uh, and to defend oneself, many of those things have gone not in the law courts. But in, in many other institutions in which people spend their lives, their careers. And I think that is worrying. And it's something that we've all kind of acquiesced in over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. I'm going to quote from Ed West's Substack in which he lists a series of recent arrests and convictions of people who tweeted their controversial opinions. He says, it is also an illiberal status quo that tends to punish only certain opinions. Aside from the Glasgow man convicted of tweeting about Captain Tom, the vast majority of these cases seem to involve people who have offended progressive norms or who are seen as being enemies of the progressive alliance. Whilst middle-aged women who question the prevailing beliefs over gender are visited by the police and football fans are arrested for the smallest of offence, extremist imams who preach jihad seem to get a relatively easy ride. Now, I wonder whether you think there's any historical comparisons between now and the kind of atmosphere around freedom of speech, not being able to say things that are so-called dissident opinions to the prevailing current uh, opinions of the elites um, throughout English history. Yes. Well, the idea that we've always been a country of liberty and free speech is, of course, not true. Um, you can get your ears cut off under the Stuarts for sedition, um, Poor old John Wilkes, great nineteenth-century radical, eighteenth-century uh, radical, um, was uh, was um, <clears throat> was put on trial for blasphemy because he'd uh, he'd written an obscene poem and he'd said rude things about bishops. Um, being rude to bishops was uh, regarded as blasphemy. So um, you might say we're not we're getting back towards that to some extent. I mean, I think you know we very few societies have enjoyed the degree of individual liberty that. Some European countries and ours, well, I would say eminent among them, have enjoyed since um, since the beginning of the 19th century, um, in which, you know, you could say, well, it was an increasingly urban and educated population, which was not uh, so easy to, um, to keep uh, under the thumb of the elite. But nevertheless, there were limits on what you could say, you know. Uh, we, we, well, you're, you're much too young, but uh, your older listeners will remember uh, the, the trial of uh, or, or the case against Penguin for publishing Lady Chatterley's Lover in the 1960s, when um, uh, you know a distinguished work of English fiction was regarded as as obscene, uh, so much so that its publishers could be prosecuted. Actually, could I can I get yes, uh, yeah. my, yes, my yeah, book? Going <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, this is what he said. This was a Russian exile, Alexander Helton. The freer a country is from government interference the more intolerant grows the mob. Your neighbour, your butcher, your tailor, family, club, parish, keep you under supervision and perform the duties of a policeman. So, I mean, I think, you know, Victorian England was very, very much policed, but not policed by the, by the state. So I, th so I think what we're now seeing um, is in some ways um, the, the resurgence of a kind of Victorian level of moral policing by the respectable the respectable and other the woke.
um, in which people who are thought to be not respectable, you know, the football fans you mentioned, um, or elderly women, uh, are, are thought to be people who are, would, should properly be brought under control. I mean, we, we had in the 1960s the destruction of Victorian morality and a kind of moral free-for-all, which you could say and do anything, or so it seemed, um, and, and a, a very clear and deliberate dismantling of social controls. Uh, capital punishment, corporal punishment, uh, you know, all those things in a few years were deliberately um, abolished. And now we, we're going back to a state in which um, these things are, are to be policed once again, but in a different way. To some extent, by as Hudson said, your your butcher, your baker, your tailor, but also and also by your your employer, uh, and also by the the mob, which is now the, the of course the Twitter mob. Uh, for Hudson, it was presumably people coming round and banging on your door. Though we may be seeing that again for MPs, but it's more people jumping on you uh, on on social media, and um, I sometimes think of this as as like uh, Foucault's pendulum, you know that that goes backwards and forwards, but because the earth is turning, it never goes quite backwards and forwards in the same place. So we, we've had periods of, uh, of license, which the 18th century was probably one, and then we had a period of Victorian repression, and then we swung back to the 1960s, which in some ways were not unlike the 18th century in some of their, 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 their morals and their, their determination to assert liberty. And now we're swinging back towards Victorianism, but not in the same way that the Victorians did it. Another set of beliefs, another, another set of behaviour is now being regarded as unacceptable. But whereas, you know, the Victorian working classes were pretty well kept under control by quite a lot of harassment of one sort or another by the police, um, by, by their neighbours, by their workmates, by charities present day equivalent of N, you know or, or the Victorian equivalent of NGOs we see rather similar things happening now and it's sometimes you know the the sort of do gooding the the do gooder class who in Victorian times would have been the lady bountiful who visits the poor and tells them that they've got to smarten themselves up and not drink so much we're getting a, a not dissimilar kind of moral censoriousness from the the descendants of the Victorian uh, middle classes who are now the people who, who now as then are the people who are largely running the country. I know that uh, Telegraph columnist Tim Stanley certainly argues that the 1990s were quite unique in terms of levels of freedom of speech. People could say all sorts of offensive things mm. in, in, in quite public forums and nothing would happen to them or they wouldn't be censored in the same way that people are today. And perhaps that was a, a very sort of short and, and perhaps utopian uh, period in terms of freedom of speech. Well, yeah, there was a whole generation like that, I suppose, you know, from the 70s onwards, probably. Um, you know, OK, it has its, that too has its problems, as we know. Um, we're constantly see seeking a balance between liberty and licence. And I think we've swung much more towards um, uh, rep repression for, for the time being. Uh, but there may be, there may be a, a pushback against that because, as you know, the government has adopted legislation on free speech, which requires universities to defend free speech in a way that they had not always been doing previously. I want to end the interview by talking about some of the more interesting characters throughout English history oh. and perhaps some people who people perhaps don't know of or aren't particularly aware of. And I know that when I read your book, I mean, first of all, I was fascinated by just how exceptional our history was, even going back to the Anglo-Saxon period in terms of um, comparing us to other nations. And you do all sorts of GDP calculations. And things, <laughs> and it's just so I find that so interesting. But also one of the characters I really um, found fascinating, I'd never heard of was William Tyndale. Yes. Um, and perhaps you can talk a bit about some of those characters in English history who, as I say, were very, very significant, perhaps, but perhaps have not uh, got that same recognition. Yes, I'd be, I'd be glad to. Well, Tyndale, I mean, I, uh, could I say, it, uh, this is sort of self-deprecation. We seem to be, as a country, pretty... We take our history very lightly. We don't, we don't teach it much in schools. I mean, in, most, in many countries, Tyndale would be a great national hero because... In many ways, he created modern English. The English of Shakespeare is to a large degree the English of Tyndale. And he did this by translating the Bible into English. 
And um, the, the later version, the King James Bible that we know, and other other 16th century ed- editions of the Bible, were to, to considerable extent based on Tyndale. And the kind of English that he used, which was simple, down to earth English, is the English that we can still understand. You can you can you know you can read Tyndale, as you can read Shakespeare. But I remember reading one one distinguished Shakespearean scholar saying that Shakespeare would have had difficulty in reading Chaucer. But we can still read Shakespeare, and it's partly because of the, you know, the, the the vigor and simplicity of Tyndale's translation, which he did pretty well single-handed, an amazing feat. Because the, the King James Bible took a whole committee of Oxbridge dons, um, I don't know how many years to to do, and they largely used Tyndale anyway. And wasn't Tyndale on the run from he was. Catholics he was in on the, the Netherlands run. as well? Yeah, he was on the run. He was originally he was eventually caught and executed, um, and. Uh, and burnt. I mean, he fortunately he was he was dead when he was, his body was burnt. But yes, he was burnt as a heretic. Um, he was a, yeah, okay. He was a what would then have been regarded as a reformer. I mean, he was a and was was very keen on making the the Bible available to ordinary people. You know, this is a, this this has an impact equal to to the the internet, in which people are suddenly able to read for themselves what is at the very heart of their culture, and which previously they had been re- required to, they had had to rely on the educated to explain it to them and tell them what it was that they should, they should believe and know. Now they could actually do it themselves. And that was an amazing revolution culturally and, and indeed politically. So yes, a great hero, but also a great hero whose, whose, whose consequences included a, a large degree of... Um, of um, of, of conflict and turmoil. Are there any other figures perhaps you can think of? I'm putting you to test here a bit. Yes, okay. Well, actually, one I think we ought to know much more about um, was um, was Bishop Crowther, who was, as a little boy, a little African boy who had been enslaved, captured, he was on a, a slave ship, and the ship was stopped, and uh, he was released by the Royal Navy and taken to Sierra Leone, and uh, and there he was educated, and he became the first black African bishop of the Church of England. Now, that's something I think we should be hugely proud of, and I think he should be a celebrated figure. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I don't really understand why he's not. And to finally end, end the interview again, um, I just want to talk about this idea of English exceptionalism. Yes. Um, how, how do you assess England's impact on the world today? I know that's a very broad question, but I think it's a it's one that perhaps people don't think about quite as often as they should. I mean, all countries are exceptional in the sense that all national histories are unique. What is particular about ours, I would say, particularly since the um, the end of the seventeenth century, when England was um, just another European country, except okay, an offshore island, but very marginal to the things that were happening in Europe culturally practically unknown and unknown territory. Nobody spoke English apart from in England until it started to become through various processes a major force in the the way that human history was being made. Partly through the development of political institutions partly through the Industrial Revolution the, the, the change in economic and social life which for both good and ill transformed and is still transforming the whole of human history. Also through, through its language, and it's bec- because of its growing political importance, and indeed its imperial importance, and because of its economic position as a, as a pioneer, English then starts to become the first ever world language. And that again is um, a cultural change that is um, really astonishing. Uh, you, you might say, well, won't it be replaced by Chinese? Or will it cease to matter because we'll all have um, handheld translation devices or, or, or microchips in our heads that will mean we can understand all languages? Well, maybe. But for the time being, English is the, it, it's the first time that the world has been able to communicate directly with, with, with itself. And that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, Edward Said, who's a great critic of the British Empire and of what, uh, what he called Orientalism, nevertheless said that the British Empire made the world one. And I think, you know, making the world one is something which has both benefits and disadvantages. 
certainly great disadvantages for some, but nevertheless, again, a hugely important thing in history. Um, and going from, as it were, the sublime to the, the less sublime, well, football, <laughs> if you were to say, you know, if, if future centuries are still interested in us, or indeed if there are still human beings here in a few hundred years' time, what might they think is the great cultural contribution of England to world culture? And they might well say, they might say it's football, which, um, as you, you probably know, was developed as a, as a rules-bound game in, in Cambridge in the 1860s and then became a great, the great working-class sport by the end of the century and from there spread all across, all across the world in a way that cricket and, and rugby never did. But football did. Football has something, perhaps its simplicity and the fact you can play it anywhere and you don't need anything other than a ball. Um, that it's become the main leisure activity of, you know, perhaps the majority of the human race, which is a strange thought. It still seems that there is something to be said for the old white men of England, um, <laughs> despite the current uh, current sort of political atmosphere. Thank you very much, Robert Toombs, for joining us. That it's been was a pleasure to talk to you. Excellent. Steve. I really enjoyed that. Thank you.